Hello, possibly lovely podcast people. I'm on the Stairmaster in the gym. I've just been responding to a few DMs on Instagram of the same nature. I tried to record a video. And it sounds terrible, so I'm trying it on this voice record. Essentially, it's around my comments regarding insulin and insulin sensitivity. And people are essentially questioning, either very, very politely, or questioning in relation to a friend, or or directly challenging the notion that insulin or insulin sensitivity plays a role in fat loss. Now, you know, one of the comments was essentially, you know, some of my friends are using, you know, GBL, GLP-1 agonist, like semaglutide, I think the one mentioned was Zempic, which I think is the one it's bigger in the UK. You know, they swear that their weight loss is much greater than before them when they've reduced calories. And then, so essentially, it must be due to insulin sensitivity. Now, there's a few things to notice with this, in that if you compare the impact of these drugs on various markers, so a GLP agonist will do a few things. Probably the most profound pharmaceutical effect that it has is the reduction of appetite. So people naturally reduce the calories that they're eating. So if someone's eating a 1500 calorie plan, and they say, I'm not losing weight. Then you give them this drug and they stay on their 1500 calorie plan and suddenly they start losing body fat. And what's happening is, is they thought they were eating 1500 and they were failing and then they take this medication and it becomes subconsciously easier to stick to the actual amount of calories daily. So another thing which can be slightly motivating is weight loss, not fat loss. So if it does happen, now something like metformin is another drug in this same area via a different mechanism. So metformin and GLP-1 agonists can be used at the same time. They're not, they don't work by the same mechanisms. Now, metformin is arguably much more directly affecting insulin sensitivity um, due to some of the pathways that it acts upon and the kind of the major reduction in what's called hepatic glucose production, which is your body putting glucose back into the body, um, into your bloodstream. And so via some of these mechanisms, we, we kind of see insulin sensitivity increasing. There's a change in kind of glucose and lipid metabolism. But what can happen is when someone's insulin resistant, which remember, you simply reduce calories, you will instantly become more insulin sensitive. As soon as fat loss starts occurring, as soon as liver glycogen, muscle glycogen, slightly depleted, you'll get an increase in what's called non-insulin sensitive glucose uptake. <laughs> There's a guy in the car park taking photos of my car. Always nice to see. And so, one of these side effects is increasing insulin sensitivity when you take an appetite lowering medication because you lose weight, you lose fat, you lower glycogen levels, you reduce fat sores both under your skin but also around your organs. Blood markers improve, your fasting blood glucose, fasting insulin, HbA1c over time comes down, um, but even cholesterol levels will improve. But when you look at metformin, the research on metformin, the weight loss effects are rubbish, that you're getting increase in insulin sensitivity. GLP-1 agonists seem to reduce body weight a lot more, highly likely simply through a reduction in calories, which is what people are arguing against. Yeah, calories might matter, but there's other things that matter loads. They don't. Insulin sensitivity doesn't matter loads. The improvement with lots of these medications is just a side effect. Although metformin, like I said, does have these direct impacts through impacting like 5 a and PK pathways. So you've got this situation of, uh, and the, the other thing I wanted to say is, when we get increased insulin sensitivity from a successful diet, a reduction in calories, you get a reduced resorption of sodium from the kidneys, which when someone's insulin resistant, one of the reasons that can increase blood pressure is because they're not essentially removing salt or sodium for all intended purposes. You can call it salt 
And so their blood pressure is going up because it's a closed system. Salt takes water with it. And we get increased asthma volume. You know, among other reasons in terms of arterial dilation, whatever being impacted when people have unhealthy lifestyles and smoking, eating too much, not exercising, not sleeping enough. But the point being, when we become more insulin sensitive, when we reduce our calories somewhat, we get a big weight loss, not just fat loss, because you see insane levels of weight loss in some individuals. We're talking like 20 pounds in a week because they simply are reducing body water levels because they are able to appropriately manage blood electrolyte levels, body electrolyte levels, salt, sodium, through the body not keeping that sodium in the body via your kidneys. So yes, you might see, oh my goodness, my body weight's gone down a bit more, then that's motivating, then you wanna to stick to it, then everything just gets better, life gets easier, because you weigh a bit less, so you walk around a bit more, et cetera, et cetera. So until someone comes back, and there are some very viable mechanisms by which insulin sensitivity might play a role in weight loss, but it all comes back to energy balance. So in the instance of leptin sensitivity, which we might say is downstream, maybe of, or in the pathway of insulin sensitivity, but not directly, we can say, well, when someone becomes more leptin sensitive, and the research supports this, that although long-term weight loss, we get an increase in appetite, when someone starts moving far away from what this might be termed their set point or settling point, we get the situation of increased hunger. It's part of metabolic adaptation. Not only do we move around less, we subconsciously, I reduce non-exercise activity thermogenesis, but we also get an increase in appetite hormones. So we're hungrier. Some of the research by Kevin Hall even postulates that for every one kilogram you lose, and I don't think this is entirely accurate in that, but as in universal across the board, because of the very simple reason that I'm about to explain, when we get increased leptin sensitivity, leptin is a hormone that one, helps us move around a bit, burn off some energy, but also impacts our appetite. A key reason that bodybuilders who are very, very lean, because leptin is produced from our adipose tissue, they have very low leptin levels. So their appetite goes crazy. Doesn't matter how much they eat, they cannot stop eating. They're so hungry. So the reason for that is, is they're not producing leptin. If someone's leptin deficient, they will never be full up. So you have these children crying for food, six-year-olds weighing 10 stone, 15 stone, because they just eat all the time. And they're never satisfied and they're crying and their parents feel terrible. You give them leptin injections, it solves it. You give leptin injections to someone who isn't leptin deficient due to a genetic mutation, and what happens? Nothing, because the body is not sensitive to leptin. So when someone loses weight, I've done 26 minutes on the stepper. I've never done more than 15 minutes in my life. Even when I was competing in bodybuilding, I could never do more than 15 minutes cardio. Well done, Instagram and pretend podcast episodes. So when someone's not leptin sensitive, it doesn't switch off appetite. So at the initial stages of fat loss, we can increase leptin sensitivity, and then you're less hungry. You're better able to manage your appetite. So there's lots of these things that can be helpful. With these drugs, again, these drugs will only slightly lower appetite. They're not fat burners. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about GLP-1 agonists, not metformin and the like. And again, there's people who shouldn't be able to distribute these products. Uh, you know, even doctors, we all know that they are under time pressure. They don't know much about nutritional ways. They don't have the best training but most of them want to help as best they can. And they have these drugs at their disposal. A fantastic doctor will say diet, exercise, encourage some resistance training, appropriate diet rather than just go keto. And at the same time, explain these drugs well, which is why at MNU, we try to educate our students on stuff that loads of our competitors, because they're obviously very uh, threatened by us, try to criticize them. Oh, they teach clinical, that's wrong. You don't teach people to go around doing stuff, even though a random beautician can get hold of weight loss injections these days. 
but by being informed, like this podcast, on various things, eating disorders, PCOS, diabetes, severe obesity, they can be better prepared to help manage, to help support a doctor's recommendations. And that's why I'm going to use the best course in the world at this present time. Anyway, I'm going to do a podcast, I think, on a much, you know, well-referenced, be a bit more prepared. But because I was answering this question so much, well, you know what? The quality of this might be terrible. And I apologise for that. I don't have a microphone. It wasn't planned. Um, I may have missed some stuff I should have talked about. But hopefully just explains to you. And until someone comes and says, a reason that insulin or insulin sensitivity is impacting weight loss so much, rather than just saying that buzzword, expecting everyone to believe them, we understand that food quality matters for people's health. But people can diet on junk food and lose loads of weight and fat. You know, everyone says, oh, go for protein first. No, it won't. Shut the front door. You don't know what you're talking about. Site reference will get the f- out. This is the thing. It all comes back to energy balance. And then how we can impact that. Is that through changing food types? Is that changing meal frequency? You know, what is it? Lots of things could be impacting it. So I think I've explained that well enough for at least some people to go. Yeah, I get it a bit more. I get why I might be experiencing that. Or a friend might be experiencing it. And also maybe some of you who are so anti these weight loss medications. I mean, that's what I want to talk about more. I don't like evidence-based people who feel threatened by medication that might help do their job. And, and you'll see lots of this. You know, people who've done other nutrition courses, nutrition degrees, have no idea how to really help people. So they get threatened by new technology, new drugs, anything that isn't, come to see me and I'll tell you how to eat less and exercise more. But whereas these things can just be really helpful adjuncts to what we do nutritional counseling, the improvement in diet that will double the amount of weight loss whilst on these drugs, um, if done well, or, or more. Because at the same time, while it will reduce your appetite a bit, you can easily undermine that through poor dietary choices. Plenty of people who use these weight loss injections and do not lose weight. That's not the weight loss injections fault. It's a lack of education, it's a lack of understanding on how they work. It's a lack of readiness to change the things that really matter. You know, people saying you have to be on them for life. You don't. You don't have to be on them for life in the same way that you don't need to be in a calorie deficit for life. But they can be helpful, but we have other means and ways to do so. Uh, but yeah, anyway, I hope you've enjoyed that podcast. I'm going to keep it relatively short, 14 minutes. That'll do. Uh, I really, really hope you can hear this. Otherwise, it'll be a big fat waste of time, won't it? Although I have improved my cardiovascular health, probably my insulin sensitivity. Anyway, much love.